Hello and welcome back to Distributions, the video series where we talk about generalized functions. And in today's part 10, we will finally define derivatives. This means we will transform the classical notion of differentiation to a notion for distributions. However, before we do that, you already know, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And please don't forget, as a supporter you can download the PDF version and the quiz for this video. Okay, now for defining the derivative of a distribution, let's first start with a classical motivation. Therefore, let's consider a continuously differentiable function f. Hence, we will write f is an element of c1. So, usually we work in Rn, however, to make everything a little bit simpler here, let's set n to 1. Indeed, in this case we know everything is easier to visualize. However, everything we do now also works in a general Rn. So now from part 5 of the series you know we get a regular distribution for such a function f. And indeed this one we denoted by t index f. However, we also get another one, namely the regular distribution associated to f prime. So here, please recall, f prime, the derivative of f, is also a continuous function. Which means it's definitely locally integrable, the thing we need for a regular distribution. Therefore, you see, we immediately get two distributions when we have one function in C1. Moreover, you also see, if n would be bigger than 1, we would get even more distributions, because we have all the partial derivatives. Okay, but now I want to do a very important calculation in the theory of distributions. Namely, we want to look what happens when we apply tf prime to a test function. So as always, we call the test function phi and we will use the duality pairing here. So this is simply tf prime applied to phi and the result is a real number. And now you know, because we have a regular distribution, this is nothing else than an integral. And inside the integral we have f prime of x times phi of x. So not a complicated integral, because now we are one dimensional in our example. Okay, now the first thing we can do is to shrink the domain of definition to the support of phi. By the definition of a test function outside of a compact set, it's zero. So we can simply choose any interval minus a to a as long as the support of phi lies inside it. So we can easily visualize that. Here we have the graph of phi and now we choose minus a to a here. Hence we definitely have that the function phi is zero at minus a and at a. Hence we are able to rewrite our integral here. So it's the same integral but now from minus a to a. Okay. And now, at this point, we have the important calculation step. Namely, we should see that we can use integration by parts. Here, please recall how this method works. It simply means that we can shift the derivative here to the other factor. However, please don't forget, then we also have a minus sign involved. However, that's not all. We also have a boundary term where the function f and the function phi is involved. More concretely, we also have to put in the limits a and minus a. However, here you should realize this term is not important at all, because we already know that phi of minus a and phi of a is exactly zero. In other words, this whole first term here simply vanishes. So because of the property of the test function phi, this is zero. So we see only the second part here remains. And indeed, we recognize this is again a distribution applied to a test function. Indeed, here it's the distribution minus tf. And the test function we consider is not phi, but phi prime. However, we know phi prime is also a well-defined test function. Hence, here with this formula, we can immediately remember the derivative of the function f is pushed to the test function phi. However, then also don't forget about the minus sign. So we see this is how a derivative works if we have a c1 function. And now you might already guess, 
This motivates the general definition we have for distributions. Hence, now we reach the topic of the video, the distributional derivative. Therefore, our starting point here is any distribution t in d prime. And indeed, now we formulate a definition for any dimension n in the natural numbers. And now the idea is that we define a new distribution, which should be the derivative of t, so we could call it t prime. However, there are already a lot of primes involved, and you know for partial derivatives, we don't use that. In fact, for partial derivatives, we use a d with a multi-index alpha. Hence, the new distribution should be d alpha t. Okay, so this should be a well-defined new distribution, no matter if t is regular or not. In conclusion, for any multi-index alpha, this is what we would call the partial derivative of t. And in the case that there can be a confusion with the classical derivative, we call it the distributional partial derivative. Okay, and now the formula to define this new distribution, you already know by the calculation from above. The only difference is now that we have to do this integration by parts with respect to the partial derivatives. However, of course, the idea is completely similar, we just have to count how many times we do it. Because each time we do it, we add a minus sign. Hence, the order of the partial derivative, denoted with the absolute value of the multi-index, decides how often we do it. So please recall, this symbol is just the sum of all the entries of the multi-index. Okay, otherwise it's completely the same idea, we shift the partial derivatives to the test function. And now we read the whole thing here as the definition for d alpha t. Moreover, you should immediately note that this indeed defines a distribution in d prime. Please recall, we need two properties for that, the first is the linearity and the second the continuity. Both things you can check now, but in fact they follow immediately. In addition, you should also note by the calculation above, that for regular distributions associated with C infinity functions, the two notions of partial derivatives we have now coincide. More precisely, this means the distributional derivative is given by the classical partial derivative. The only thing we have to do here is to translate between the regular distribution and the corresponding function. However, with this you should see that our new definition is indeed a generalization of derivatives. In particular, here you should see we don't have to say anything about existence of partial derivatives as we have to do it here. Indeed, here on this level, we have to say that f is differentiable up to some order. On the other hand, the distributional partial derivative always exists by this definition. Of course, this is a big advantage because it means we can always calculate with d alpha t no matter which distribution t we choose. And that's what we can remember, this is the big difference to the classical derivative. And I guess we can immediately illustrate that by looking at some examples. Let's start with something we have already discussed in the first part of this series. And you might remember, this was a historical example concerning the Heaviside function. And this one is a very simple one-dimensional function, which is not differentiable. Simply because it has a jump, it jumps from constant 0 to constant 1. Hence, there is no classical derivative, because there is a problem at the origin. Moreover, here I can tell you, there are different definitions what happens exactly at the jump point. However, for our calculation here, this is not important. However, most of the time, you see the value as 1 at the origin. Okay, but here, please don't forget, this is the same as in our first calculation above, n is equal to 1. And therefore, our multi-index alpha will be very simple, we just consider it as 1. So of course, for the one-dimensional case, we don't really have partial derivatives, but I don't want to change the notation we have for the distributional derivative now. In other words, I still want to write d alpha t to avoid confusion with too many primes. Hence, this here is the distributional derivative of order 1. And the distribution we now consider is th. And now we can simply apply our definition from above, which means we have minus 1 to the power 1, and we shift the derivative to the right. 
and in this case it's a normal derivative, so indeed we can write phi prime. Okay, and now here on the right hand side we see we have a regular distribution. So this means we are able to write this as an integral. And there you know, as before, we first have it as an integral over r. However, this is not surprising at all, as before we can substitute r by a bounded interval as long as the bounded interval is bigger than the support of phi. Here, of course, without changing anything, you could also write support of phi prime. Okay, so now we see we have to calculate the integral from minus a to a. However, here we already know on the negative axis h of x is exactly 0. In other words, we can simply omit this part completely and integrate from 0 to a. But there, on the positive axis, we know that h of x is equal to 1. So instead of h of x, we can simply write 1. So we see, this makes the whole integration, the whole calculation for the integral, much simpler. Because now we see we have a C infinity function here, and we can simply apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. Which means we can use an antiderivative of phi prime to calculate the integral. So not hard at all, we simply have minus phi of a minus minus phi of zero. And now please recall, we have chosen a so large that it lies outside the support of phi, so phi of a is equal to zero. Hence only the term phi of zero remains. But at this point you should notice, this can be rewritten as a delta distribution. So in other words, it's simply delta of phi. Or written as this pairing, it's simply delta phi. And now we see this whole calculation holds for all test functions phi, and then we can conclude that this distribution on the left hand side is equal to the delta distribution. Or in other words, the distribution the derivative of the heavy side function is the delta distribution. So in fact, everything is now well defined and we can make this statement. So this is definitely something you should remember. So we don't have a classical derivative, but a distributional one. It's all well defined and it makes mathematical sense. Okay, now for the end of this video, let's also look at a second example. Here I want to calculate the distributional derivative of our delta function. So to make it simple, let's choose n is equal to 1 again and then the multi-index s1 as well. In other words, the delta distribution is the same we had here. And now we have a test function phi again and we use the definition of the distributional derivative again. This means we have a minus sign again and then we shift the prime to phi. And now we see this is not complicated at all because the delta distribution is a very simple distribution. It simply uses the test function at the origin. In other words, minus phi prime of zero is the value that comes out. And there we have it. This is the distributional derivative of the one-dimensional delta distribution. So it's very similar to the original delta distribution, it just uses derivatives. And as for the delta distribution, you should note, it's not a regular distribution. Indeed, there we see an important fact we have proven in the example above. So we started with a regular distribution, but the derivative is not a regular distribution anymore. So we know the derivative in the distributional sense always exists, but the regularity can change. So in some sense you can see this is the trade-off we have with this new definition. Okay, I would say this is good enough for this video here. Let's meet in the next one about distributions. So have a nice day and see you soon. Mm -hmm.